The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. A proud member of the SubChina Network, I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good evening to you, Kobus. Good evening. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about China's growing media influence in Africa and around the world. What they're doing is engaging in a totally different set of rules in how they communicate themselves over media. This is something that we have talked about, Cobus, over the years. But what's interesting here is that a lot of people on the outside are struggling to understand some of the new methods and tactics that the Chinese are using. When we look at the presence of Chinese media in Africa, most people tend to focus on the obvious things that they see and they hear. Things like CGTN in Nairobi, China Radio International, China Daily Newspaper, Xinhua News you see all over the internet. Uh, also now more and more, you and I have been talking about this, Kobus, is the Chinese media presence on Facebook and Twitter, particularly those of diplomats. That is the very visible part of what the Chinese media presence in Africa looks like. But there's also a lot going on behind the scenes that people may not notice. So, for example, uh, Xinhua Content, which is the Chinese state news agency, uh, has they have a lot of their content now on African media sites and news sites that's masquerading as locally produced content. So, for example, Kenya Broadcasting Corporation published a story about Xinjiang that did not identify it was from Xinhua. So it looked like to the average user that this was a KBC story. That's happening quite a bit as well. Then there's the whole infrastructure development piece of all of this. Uh, we've talked a lot about Star Times, which is the satellite TV company, the pay TV company. They've received quite a bit of Chinese government money. Uh, on, Sa on Star Times, there is a a lot of programming that is very China-friendly, although Star Times itself is not a state company, it does have a lot of Chinese content. Uh, but then also there is things like the Liberia Broadcasting System. Now, back in January 2019, China rebuilt the entire LBS TV studio. And so it begs the issue, do you ever think that LBS will run a critical story of China after having their entire TV station rebuilt by the Chinese. All of this fits into how China is trying to shape its narrative, Cobus, and it makes it very, very difficult, I think, for the average African news consumer to identify what potentially could be state propaganda from legitimate editorial content. This is made even harder by the fact that in many African countries, you know, you already have a prevalence of paid for content. Um, you already have other governments paid for content being being circulated through the media, and then you have different differing levels of of freedom of press in different African countries. So African news consumers are already face some challenges. You know, in order to 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 realize who wrote what exactly. Um, and it's getting more complicated because uh, the Chinese and other actors are becoming a lot more active on social media and they're becoming a lot more active in in terms of uh, corporate acquisitions of different media outfits. Um, so there's different layers of, of messaging happening, some more explicit than others. And just to add another layer of complexity to this for the African consumer, which is not just a challenge for Africans, but also in the United States and elsewhere, uh, there were reports that came out in the recent Mozambican elections that Russia had started to inject fake news into their Facebook streams as well. So we have all of this kind of toxic brew. And it's in this context that we saw a report that came out from the U.S. NGO Freedom House. Uh, it's entitled Beijing's Global Megaphone, the Expansion of Chinese Communist Party Media Influence Since 2017. Now, this was a global report, not specifically focused on Africa. Uh, and we thought this would be a great area for us to focus on. Before we get started to our guest today, I'd like to kind of tell everybody a little bit about Freedom House. It's a U.S.-based nonprofit 
uh, that dates all the way back to 1941 and was co-founded by none other than U.S. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who back then, she's a beloved figure in American history. So for those of you not familiar with Eleanor Roosevelt, she did a lot of incredible things. Uh, The group does research and advocacy on issues related to democracy, political freedom, things like human rights. Uh, But this is where it gets a little tricky for Freedom House, and it's something we're going to discuss today as well. The majority of the funding for Freedom House does, in fact, come from the United States government. And so there is a perception that reports like the one that we're going to talk about uh, do kind of advance, advocate, and tilt towards U.S. interests and positions on what are very, very sensitive issues. So with all of that in mind, uh, we are thrilled to be able to have on the program today for the first time from New York, Sarah Cook, who is the Senior Research Analyst for China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, and the author of the report, Beijing's Global Megaphone. A very good morning to you, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Good morning. So you have this big report. It landed like a ton of bricks on social media. A lot of people were talking about it. You got, I think, a very good response for it. And the timing is very interesting because there is heightened awareness of media influence. Uh, China was alleged to have been trying to sway voters in Taiwan during their recent elections. China's presence in Africa is, uh, is obviously very, very visible to people. So why don't we start our discussion with you just kind of setting up the report and some of your key findings? Sure. So I think what we were trying to do with this report, because of, I think, the complexity and the spectrum of the ways in which uh, China and Chinese Communist Party media influence plays out around the world, was really to kind of lay out the toolbox, to uh, try to relay in a you know, reader-friendly way, what are the different ways in which um, you know, Chinese government influence, either directly or indirectly, uh, affects the information that news consumers get uh, and receive and read and listen to in different parts of the world. But one of the things that was really interesting as we've been about the research, and particularly for myself who's been following this for some time, was to really see how much uh, certain dynamics have changed um, over the last year, but even really just the last three years. And I think some of the things that come out are uh, addition of new tactics, like seeing um, the emergence of a more Russia-style disinformation efforts on social media, a greater emphasis on uh, China actually as a model uh, for how developing countries might want to um, uh, manage their media and information environment, and that being supported by various trainings and technology transfers. And just other ways in which certain tactics that you, I had documented in a previous report in 2013 that was more focused on the censorship element of how this plays out, um, really uh, that were particularly, you would see them emerging for Chinese diaspora media in particular and some international media, starting to see that branch out to a much wider array of, of local mainstream media. And so what we really looked at, the way we broke it down in terms of the, the so-called toolbox, was various avenues of um, propaganda um, being inserted into foreign media, dynamics related to censorship and the suppression of coverage that might be disfavored by Beijing, And then really something that is much newer, and that's the way in which Chinese companies with close government ties, although often private companies, um, begin insinuating themselves, have been, you know, becoming more and more of a player uh, in terms of infrastructure and in terms of particularly content delivery systems in different parts of the world. So you mentioned the the different tools um, in their toolbox for influencing foreign publics. Um, What are the most important ones that you identified? So I think for, for each one of those areas, I mean, when you look at the, the propaganda, which I think is this element of how does the Chinese Communist Party and various proxies, whether they're Chinese state media or other types of partners, work to insert Chinese government narratives into foreign media, uh, there, there is a spectrum. Some of it's very obvious. It's this large expansion of uh, Chinese state media uh, in, in different parts Uh, of the world. Um, But I think then you start to get into more nuanced things. You have the injection of uh, Chinese state content being paid for and and what the Chinese government likes to call uh, barring the boat to reach the sea. 
uh, where, where Chinese state media content is injected and in, insinuated into foreign media. So you're not necessarily going and picking up a copy of the China Daily. You might be picking up a newspaper in Senegal or Kenya or in the United States or the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and there you have a Chinese state media content. Um, and then we were seeing more and more other things related to co-productions um, or other types of private media starting to run content that's uh, really been generated uh, with Beijing's narratives in mind. Um, and so I think that's where these questions of transparency come up. Because even as you see Chinese state media, for example, growing on Facebook, one of the things we looked at was the taglines of how do these PP, these um, media outlets self-identify on Facebook. And so for people who are familiar with the Chinese media landscape, you see People's Daily and you know this is the official mouthpiece of the Communist Party. But the Facebook self-identification is the biggest newspaper in China. And they have 72 million followers on Facebook. Sure, uh, but Fox News says it's fair and balanced, right? Yeah, sure. I think I think it's just a question that's still a private media company. And that's I think it's a question of, I, mean, I think some of the points related to transparency that are and lack of transparency that are relevant uh, in the China context might be relevant to other, uh, you know, to other foreign actors. And I think even when we're looking and if we move, at, you know, later on in the conversation, if we're getting to questions of recommendations, I think a lot of the things and even the responses and examples that we give in the report of how places like New Zealand or Australia are responding, you know, in, in ways that were triggered by concern about China, um, are actually apply across the board to other foreign influence. And I would say overall, you know, strengthen the media sector and strengthen democracy in ways that might not necessarily only be relevant to, uh, to Chinese influence. Per se. Before we go much further into our discussion, I think it might be helpful to define some terms, particularly for our audience who may not be familiar with some of the nomenclature of the Chinese government. It seems that in your report and even in your comments that we're using the words Chinese Communist Party and Chinese government and Chinese state interchangeably. I think, can you just kind of break down in your understanding what the difference is between the state and the party is as it relates to media? Well, I mean, I think, to be honest, under Xi Jinping, one of the things we've seen is a greater blurring of the state and the party. Um, I think for the most part, you see that, you know, there are certain things like the people's data that is very closely aligned with the party. Um, but even when you're looking at state controlled and state owned media, which is pretty much every media outlet in China has some level of state ownership, um, the it's very clear, and Xi Jinping has made that very clear, that their role is really to, uh, quote, be surnamed party, that the Chinese government owned or state owned media that are, you know, that, that their role is to promote uh, the party's perspective, the legitimacy of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping's, uh, uh, you know, I ideology. Um, and so it is actually very hard to differentiate uh, between, you know, what's the Chinese government versus the Communist Party in many cases, uh, I think increasingly in China when you're looking at it. And then even with the foreign interactions, I mean, when you're looking at a big conference that was held for uh, Chinese diaspora media uh, that was hosted, it was hosted by the Communist Party's United Front Work Department. And so, and actually one of the things that was really interesting there uh, was that I think there were something like, there were over a dozen news outlets uh, from Africa, um, from I think eight different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so this is, you know, one, you know, a lot of those media are probably privately owned, not just in Africa. I didn't look at specifically at the details of the African ones. Certainly you see in terms of the US or Australia, the Canadian or Taiwanese attendees, these are privately owned entities. But a lot of them, the owners have very close ties to China, have business interests in China, and are generally seen in those local media markets as promoting uh, Beijing's perspective and narratives. So I think that's, again, this question of where things get a little murky, where you might have have uh, ostensibly privately owned media even outside of China, but that are seen, I think, for those who are looking at this space closely as having been co-opted in one way or another uh, to promote Beijing's narratives rather than, and in some cases, content like from Xinhua News, um, as opposed to engaging in independent journalism. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. 
Follow the ACRP on Twitter at VitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Um, where do you see the majority of the energy going um, in this work? So, you know, you know, my my, my um, assumption would be that there would be greater concern in in within China to to drive um, the or, or to to influence the 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 public conversation um, in large markets in prominent countries and particularly prominent countries with with large Chinese populations. Um, how do you see that compared to the global south or countries where you know poorer countries with smaller Chinese populations? Do, you know, kind of is is my assumption correct that that the, the majority of the resources would go to try and push. Uh, the 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 global or the the public conversation in places like New Zealand, Australia, or Canada, compared to Africa, for example. Um, I, I'm not sure that that assumption is correct. It's very hard to get a full breakdown in terms of the amount of money, say, being spent. But if you look at the actual reach and the resources and the effort that is being put into uh, reaching very very small countries, even places like the Maldives. Um, or different parts of Africa, uh, there's there's actually quite an emphasis uh, on reaching audiences in the global south. I think that's actually sometimes where 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 China uh, maybe does a better job um, of than than countries like the United States, um, which which might be focused on 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 more influential countries. But for the Chinese government, the Communist Party, uh, even small countries count. You know whether it's Pacific Island nations, and you see that for example, I think when you look at social media and. Facebook. I um, mean, it's some of these, you know, they run a lot of ads uh, trying to recruit uh, new followers. And those are really global. And in some cases, for example, the, the Facebook has changed the way you can look at what, what ads, um, you know, have been run and where. Um, but this was maybe a year or two ago when I had looked at some of the ads running in French um, to promote CGTN Francaise's page. And actually, they were running ads only in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. They weren't spending time trying to promote their Facebook page in places like France or Belgium. So I think especially when you look uh, at social media, for example, um, that's one of the places where there's really a, a very global effort and an emphasis on the global south. But not only, even when you look at, you know, whether it's ambassadors' engagements, Xi Jinping's travel schedule, I mean, that's where the Chinese government is actually very good at, at, at really placing an emphasis on countries that, that, and media markets that might not otherwise get attention from big global actors. You wrote in the report, uh, let me just quote from your report, Chinese officials are making a more explicit effort to present China as a model for other countries, and they are taking concrete steps to encourage emulation through trainings for foreign personnel and technology transfers to foreign state-owned media outlets. What what I felt was missing in the report was some broader context. And I used to work for France 24, which is state-owned, uh, paid for by the Ministry of Culture in France and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, with the express intent of getting the world to see the way the world is through French eyes. Voice of America does the same thing. RT, the Russians do the same thing. Uh, the Americans have uh, Radio Marti to explicitly challenge the uh, Cuban government, Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe. There's a whole media infrastructure in the United States that's really done for the same thing. When I was at France 24, we had training programs that we did the same thing, where we would teach them how to do journalism our way, the French way, which is different, by the way, than the American way. There is no standard way of doing journalism. So I guess my question is, how much of what you documented in your report is just what governments do to get to, to facilitate their the other parts of their foreign policies. And the Chinese, in this sense, may not be that exceptional, even though it seems, you know, it, it seems scary when you just package it all together, but when you put it into a broader context to say, well, most major governments are doing something similar. Uh, give me your response to that. Well, I think, I mean, in the report, we acknowledge that some of the things that are the types of activities being engaged in are part of public diplomacy. And I think when there's a degree of, of transparency um, that's that's related as part of that, then, you know, what the Chinese government is doing isn't really so different from what other governments may be doing. I think when it comes to journalist trainings, look, it, it depends on, on your perspective of, of democracy and human rights and press freedom. And if you're looking at what are still accepted international 
standards uh, related to best practices when it comes to independent journalism and when it comes to media freedom uh, versus uh, a Chinese model that is very party st- party controlled. It's um, it, it leaves very little room, not only for criticism, say, of the leader, but for coverage of public health issues. Um, and, um, and for investigative journalism that really benefits the public. And so I think in terms of looking at the impact, where you're talking about on the one hand, a training of journalists that, again, I don't know the content of say, you know, what the French were doing. Certainly the U.S., you know, has a scholarship program, uh, a fellowship program that brings journalists from all over the world to the United States for various types of opportunities to engage, um, you know, to see the U.S., to see the U.S. media environment. But I think there the idea is really of, of kind of encouraging an openness uh, and a critical viewpoint. And in fact, you know, people will ask all kinds of questions, including questions that are critical of the U.S. government. When you, you know, you, when you have conversations with people who have gone on the Chinese journalism training programs, um, you know, it, it, there's a clear sense that there's one way of what you can do. There's only so much that you can ask certain questions. Um, and that, uh, you know, the emphasis is really on trying to, um, you know, to, to encourage a much more uh, government-leaning, uh, narrower uh, type of information environment, as opposed to one that enables a greater degree of diversity, and I would argue a better uh, quality of information, uh, or at least uh, more viewpoints for people and, and space for people to voice uh, and, and to get information that they would like. But I think the other point, reason, you know, I think one of the reasons we really emphasize that point in the findings, you know, goes to, I think, this bigger question of what is the Chinese government's motivations? How much are they trying to influence? How much is this just the way they do things? Because I think one of the problems with the way, with challenges the way the Chinese government or state media or other companies go about their activities um, relates to elements of uh, not just lack of covertness, but there is an element of co- coercion in some cases. There is an element, uh, a covert element. And I think when you look especially at some of the things described in the censorship um, chapter, uh, that is where you get to, to more coercive and aggressive uh, forms of intervention in foreign media uh, environments uh, that I think many people would find more problematic. So I think there is a question, though, of how much there has been a question of how much are they actively trying to promote the China model. And for a long time, the Chinese government shied away from that. But especially since the 19th Party Congress and Xi Jinping making that be an explicit point, I think we are seeing more resources and emphasis on that framing and on that uh, effort uh, than we had seen previously. So that was one of the reasons why we highlighted that particular finding. Have you been able to get some kind of impression of what the impact is of of all of this media work? Um, because my my own background is in media studies, um, and you know, in my own experience, it's mapping mapping the presence of Chinese media in a particular foreign market, and I was always focusing on Africa, is a lot easier than getting an impression of how ma- how many people are actually watching it. Um, you know, so for example, I would, um, you know, C- CGTN has, at, at, le- as, at the moment, I think two channels on standard South African um, cable TV, which is the, the dominant way that South Africans watch TV. Um, and I would, I was asked students, when I was still teaching, I was I was I was asked students um, how many of them have DSTV, and all of them had, and then how many of them even knew where on the dial the Chinese channels were, and none none of the students even knew that none of them had even watched it once. So could could you give me an idea of like what what like how what's your kind of metric for the impact of 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 this news rather than the, its market presence? So that's a really good question. I think it is something that's hard to get a, a handle on. But I also think that the, the quest, there's also a question of what do we mean by impact? So if you're looking at in terms of, say, is it improving uh, Xi Jinping's image and China's image in different regions? If you look, and this is correlation, say, rather than causation per se, but if you generally look at you know, Pew surveys of um, you know, impressions of China, uh, you do see that for the most part in the, develop, in the developing world in the global south, uh, that China and Xi Jinping personally score quite a bit better than in other parts of the world. And there was one really interesting study that a professor, she's based in Washington, I think, Katie Snow Bayard did, which was very, really quite rigorous, where she did look at um, the correlation between China's growing media footprint and 
in six African countries in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Uganda, and public opinion between 2006 and 2013. 13. And she has, you know, these detailed regression analysis. But but I think what she did find in the end was that in many cases, the larger the Chinese state media presence, and also she looked at the more um, access to the relevant media technology that people had, the more favorable public opinion was across China, and the more it had grown across multiple dimensions. So it seems like there is perhaps some academic evidence of, of, of impact. But I think it's also important to think about it's not only about CGTN, it might be coming through Facebook, it might be coming through some of these other areas where Beijing's narratives are being inserted that people may not necessarily be aware that it's coming from Chinese state media. If you were to advise um, governments in the global south, particularly in Africa, governments who are concerned uh, about uh, about press freedom um, and uh, about having a, a balanced um, palette of, of of media, you know, presented to their populations. How would you advise them to deal with, with this pressure from the Chinese government, considering that a lot of it is on, on um, public platforms, including American-owned platforms like Twitter? Um, a lot of it is happening in, in very you know standard corporate ways, like mergers and acquisitions and other, other kind of ways of, of simply buying space in, in, a, in a commercial media landscape. Um, you know, a lot of the, of the Chinese influence isn't happening, you know, isn't, there isn't very little coercion happen, you know, kind of to, to get this this content into the market. Um, you know, re- responding to that kind of situation, how would you advise governments like that to proceed? So I think, um, you know, there are a few things if you look at what other governments around the world are actually doing, particularly if you're looking at uh, places like Taiwan, at Australia, at New Zealand, at certain laws in the United States that really aim to uh, increase transparency about who owns what or in other ways in which increased transparency surrounding uh, funding for this or for that, or just for news consumers to know that certain information is coming from this or that source. Um, and then I think on the question of you know cross ownership, where is there a situation where uh, a, a company or an entity that is responsible for and that owns content dissemination platforms also has an interest in promoting particular content or f- particular content from a certain content provider compared to uh, a rival? And, and so I think if you're looking, for example, issues related to Star Times, you know, you have situation where after the transition from analog to digital, you see that the most affordable and therefore the most popular um, um, packages often feature local media outstations and Chinese government stations, and then don't feature it to the same level as you might expect a potential rival, say like the BBC World. And so I think to the extent um, that there are certain rules that could be in, put in place uh, that are generally often considered best practice in terms of media regulation, that could help um, with maintaining as diverse um, a, a set of information and information from more uh, independent, editorially independent sources uh, than what might be available otherwise. And I think that's some of what you've seen take place, say, by the National Communications um, Commission in Taiwan in terms of certain conditions they've placed on mergers and the like. So it's not necessarily saying that you shouldn't have any kind of Chinese investment in this. It's a sense question of what are some certain conditions you might want to put on looking ahead to the ways in which control over these platforms could in the future um, really have uh, you know significant impact on the diversity or the type of material or even the partisan nature of one you know one type of content or another uh, in a way that could really harm uh, the press freedom environment uh, you know in a particular country and I think some countries have that those types of regulations in place um, you know in some cases apparently it hasn't been enforced in places like Zambia uh, as it should be and I think that's one of the criticisms that has emerged there but I think that idea 
of looking at, you know, what are countries that foreign influence laws in, uh, in Australia uh, that require uh, re- registration, uh, you know, uh, certain types of registration for related to communications, conversations in New Zealand about percentage of foreign ownership that are, have been provoked in some case because of the role of China in those countries, but that apply across the board. I mean, even foreign, the Foreign Agents Registration Act in the United States that, um, that China Daily is registered under, for example, doesn't just apply to China. Uh, there are Canadians, there are Belgians who, who are registered under FARA. Um, so I think those types of um, actions and policies can uh, be important, not just with regards to the role of China, um, but, but just in general in protecting sovereignty and freedom and, and best practices in terms of media regulation in a particular country. The report is Beijing's Global Megaphone, the Expansion of Chinese Communist Party Media Influence Since 2017. It was written by Sarah Cook, who's the Senior Research Analyst for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House, where she is also the director of the China Media Bulletin. Uh, Quickly, before we go, Sarah, tell us a little bit about the China Media Bulletin and how people can get it, and does it cost any money? (laughs) Sure. So it is free, (laughs) Um, and um, it's a monthly bulletin that really monitors, um, in terms of news and analysis, um, whatever is changing in terms of the media and information landscape related to China, both internally in China, whether it's in terms of censorship, new government regulation, surveillance, um, but but also outside China. We always have a Beyond China section, and uh, you know that features examples from Africa periodically. Um, and so, you know, for those who might want to receive this in their inbox, you can email cmb at freedomhouse.org or just freedom, visit Freedom House's website. And if people want to follow you and what you're reading and writing these days, what's the best way for them to stay in touch? Uh, probably to follow me on, on Twitter, and you can find the China Media Bulletin there because I share it every time we come out with a new issue. Um, and my, my Twitter handle is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H underscore G underscore Cook. Well, we will put links to the China Media Bulletin, also to Sarah's Twitter handle in the show notes. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for your interest in the report. So this is an issue that we cover all the time. We focus on media influence, digital influence, infrastructure influence, all of this together in our daily newsletter that goes out to key stakeholders all over the world. We would love to have you join our community of readers. If you're interested, it's $7 a month for students, $15 a month for everybody else, students and faculty, I should say, or $149 a year. But it is a great concentrated digest of China Africa news. And if you have made it to this point in the podcast, you are a loyal, loyal listener and uh, someone who I think would enjoy uh, what Kobus and I are writing every day. And we're filtering through and curating and kind of bringing some analysis to the China Africa story, but on a daily basis. So if you'd like to subscribe, head over to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Uh, There you'll find all of our other news, and you can find also our China Africa Experts Network, which is growing very, very quickly and has just a wonderful repository of young African and Chinese researchers, scholars, analysts, activists, you name it, they're there, and it's just a great resource. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Thank you.